Hello, and welcome to this discussion about validity versus soundness. Um, I want to spend the, the time uh, that we have um, going through through these slides talking about validity and soundness. Um, but the, uh, the main point that I want to get to in, in talking about them um, is how they're used in argumentation and how they're used in, in debate. And so that's the main focus of, of these slides. I'm going to talk about um, which each, what each one of these things means, um, but the, the main focus is really going to be on constructing a good argument, constructing a good debate um, based off of these principles. And so with that being said, let's go ahead and, and take a look um, at um, what uh, validity means first. Um, an argument is um, invalid if the premises um, are uh, uh, unable to to present the conclusion um, that follows in, in an argument. So if, if the premises are true, um, the conclusion could could still be false. And there's a number of different examples that we have um, about this, but I want to I want to show just kind of one argument really quick here. Um, that's an easy way to, to see um, why why it's invalid. So if we if we take a look here, um, the argument says some people are rich and beautiful. I'm a person. Therefore, um, you know, I must be rich and beautiful. And as you can see, this is a, is a type of argument where the two premises, some people are rich and beautiful and I am a person, both of those can be absolutely true. Um, so assumedly, there are some people who are both rich and beautiful. Um, assumedly, I am a person. Both of those things can be true. But the conclusion that's brought about because of that, right? Well, I must be rich and beautiful. Um, that doesn't follow from, from the premises that are given. Um, and the main reason why it doesn't follow is because the first premise says that some people are rich and beautiful and not that all people are rich and beautiful. And so the second premise that you are a person doesn't force the idea that you have to be rich and beautiful because you may be one of those people who um, is still a person, but you are not rich and beautiful. You may not fall into that some category. And so um, looking at an invalid argument, it's, it's not very hard to see um, that what, what makes it invalid is the fact that, that those premises, even if they are true, um, they don't lead to the conclusion uh, necessarily. Following that, um, we can look at um, well, what makes something uh, a valid argument, right? So that if it's invalid, um, even if the premises are true, the conclusion can still be false. Um, a, a valid argument, um, the premises have to add up to the conclusion, right? So um, if the premises are true, then the conclusion is true as well. That's a valid argument. Um, and so if we take a look here, um, I think this is a, a very good kind of example. It says, according to a witness, the killer was tall with blonde hair. George is neither tall, nor does he have blonde hair. Therefore, George could not be the killer. And so if you look at this argument really quick, that the two premises um, that form the conclusion um, are, are those first two statements. According to a witness, the killer was tall with blonde hair. So um, we know right away that if that is true, um, then um, at least according to that witness, um, that the killer cannot be uh, short <laughs> or, or something else. Um, the second statement um, is, uh, the negation of of that first idea, right? Uh, George is is neither tall nor does he have blonde hair. So again, going, going back to kind of our four forms of logic that we we talked about, um, this is really uh, thinking about things that, from a contrapositive point of view, um, right? Not not B, therefore not A, right? George could not be the killer because um, he doesn't fit the the description. And so in this um, argument. Uh, it, it is valid because as long as those premises are true, the conclusion is going to naturally follow through with that. Um, what, what I'd point out is that you already, uh, through this class, know four different forms of valid arguments. Um, and if we just review them very quickly here, uh, modus ponens is that argument, if A, then B, A, therefore B. Um, <laughs> the contrapositive is if A, then B, not B, therefore not A. Um, the uh, disjunctive syllogism is it's either A or it's B, and you know it's not one of those, so it has to be the other, 
right? If A or B, not A, therefore B, either A or B, not B, therefore A. Um, and then the final one is the syllogism. Um, if A equals B and B equals C, then A also has to equal C. And so there's different ways of employing all those arguments. Um, and again, I have those slides available for you if you, if you need to see them. Um, but what's important to keep in mind is that all four of those forms of arguments are valid arguments. They're arguments where um, if the premises are true, the conclusion absolutely follows. And so looking at this, one thing that we could also point out about a valid argument is the fact that um, you can argue whether or not the premises are actually true. So for instance, um, if, you, if you look at this, even though it's a valid argument, um, you might still say, well, I don't think it's, it's probably true. I think one of those premises may be false. Um, so if we look at the first premise, according to a witness, the killer was tall with blonde hair. I, um, there's lots of ways in which we can question uh, the truth of, of that statement. Um, one of them is, right, how, uh, what was the conditions under which the witness made the statement, right? Were, were they making the statement um, under um, some kind of duress uh, with someone forcing them to make this statement? Um, what about the reliability of the witness themselves? Um, are they a, a reliable, authoritative um, person who can definitively say uh, what the killer was like, right? Whether the killer was tall or with blonde hair, right? How are they in a position like to know and understand uh, that statement? Um, and of course, the second premise is something that you can argue with as well, but, but obviously the, the first one is, is going to be the more likely um, kind of uh, thing that you're going to attack. But things that we could say on, on the second premise, right, George is neither tall nor does he have blonde hair, you could say, well, think about the conditions under which, right, that, that can be true. Um, so, you know, even though you, you may know nothing about George, you know, when I see the name George, I typically think of Curious George, right? And this this falls true for, for Curious George. He is neither tall nor does he have blonde hair. Um, but um, you can say, well, you know, what, what, what are we defining as tall, right? Does that match the description, like, entirely? When we're saying blonde hair, like, what do we mean? Do we mean, like, blonde highlights? Do we mean, right, the entire hair is blonde? Are we talking about, like, a brownish blonde? Like, what, what exactly constitutes, like, blonde hair here? And, of course, um, the one thing that you don't want to do with a valid argument is attack the logic. Um, because again, this this does logically fit. You can derive this conclusion from those premises. And so before we move on here, one distinction that we can make is that for an invalid argument, you're going to just simply point out the fact that logic doesn't add up, that doesn't make sense, that's completely invalid. Whereas for a valid argument, you're going to move towards the premises and you're going to ask about the reliability um, or truthfulness of the premises because you can concede that the, the conclusion certainly does follow from from the premises that are given and so you want to question well what about the truth of the premises themselves um, a final kind of tactic that we've talked about is that you can also for a valid statement um, ask whether or not that's the only conclusion that can be drawn uh, from the statements Right, so one other thing that we could say as a conclusion of this statement is, right, not just therefore George could not be the killer, but, you know, according to the witness, George could not be the killer, right? And that changes uh, the perspective of the statement uh, a whole lot, um, and that follows from the statement in a much better fashion than saying George couldn't be the killer, um, because again, the, the more accurate way of looking at this statement is really, well, that's according to the witness, right? According to the witness, George could not be the killer. And so making those kinds of, of distinctions um, about the validity of, a, of an argument um, ultimately helps you make better arguments um, as you're deciphering how you're going to argue against um, other people's positions, how you're going to argue for your position um, ultimately. Let's take a look um, at uh, the final component of this, which is uh, soundness. Um, so one important thing to keep in mind is that all sound arguments are valid arguments, um, but not all valid arguments are sound arguments. So in order for an argument to be a sound argument, it has to be a valid argument. Again, let me just think about that one more time. If it's a sound argument, it has to also be a valid argument.
And the distinction between a sound argument and a valid argument is that in a valid argument, the conclusion follows if the premises are true, but uh, the, the premises may, may or may not be true. You're, you're not really for, for sure. Um, and in fact, there's ways in which you can even show in valid arguments that the premises um, are not true. But for a sound argument, um, not only is it valid, not only do the uh, conclusions follow from the, from the premises or the conclusion follow from the premises, um, but also those premises themselves are actually true. True. And so let me give you an example here uh, of a very sound argument. Uh, New Albany is a city in Indiana. Indiana is a state in the United States. Therefore, New Albany is a city in the United States. If you go to grapple with any of those uh, premises, um, it, it'd be really hard to, to say that they're not true. Um, and of course, if we look at the validity of it first, um, does the conclusion follow from the premises? Um, this is a basic form of a, of a syllogism that we talked about. Right? Again, A is B and B is C, therefore A is C. Um, right? New Albany is a city in Indiana. Indiana is a state in the United States. Um, both of those are true. Then following the form of a syllogism, New Albany is a city in the United States. Um, there's not very many times that you can come across an argument that is absolutely a sound uh, argument um, that is also uh, a very interesting argument. Um, usually, m most of the arguments people bring out, um, they they uh, are, are brought about f for the sake that um, the, the premises themselves, um, there's some degree of variation on whether or not people agree to the truthfulness of them. Um, but sometimes, if, if you think about this um, from, from a logical standpoint, um, sometimes you can bring out a sound argument uh, in, a, in a debate um, that, that bolsters your chance. In fact, if, if you know that you can, um, this, this will strengthen you greatly. I remember one time um, there was a, a debate between a well-known theologian, William Lane Craig, I'm um, a well-known uh, atheist, uh, or anti-theist, I should say. Um, that's how he defined himself, Christopher Hitchens. I um, mean, in this debate, uh, Christopher Hitchens, um, I think I may have mentioned this example before in class, but uh, Christopher Hitchens said that um, even if you can uh, uh, be a deist, which is a, a person who has a, a position that, that God creates the universe and then leaves it to its own devices, um, he says even if you can believe in that sort of God, um, you still have all of your work left for you to, to move from a deist position to a theist position. Um, and I remember in this debate, William Lane Craig, the very next go round, just point out the fact. And he said, well, um, deism is a belief in a particular type of God and theism includes any belief in a type of God. And therefore deism is a type of theism. And so, um, theism is actually a precursor to deism instead of the other way around. Um, again, that's, that's using a syllogistic form. Um, and it's using it to make a sound argument. And so, you know, you, you, you show based off of that, not that your argument is completely true, um, but again, based off of that soundness, it at least follows, logically speaking, that um, if you are a deist, you are already a theist. Um, and so um, that, you know, bolsters the credibility of, of the argument um, that he has. And thinking about this for a moment, I want to I want to look at um, variations of, of each of these arguments. So let's take a look uh, first of all at um, an invalid argument that may still be somewhat convincing uh, towards a person. Um, so if we look at this really quick here, um, the first uh, premise that we have here is someone says any law that deprives a person of justice is an unjust law. I think most people can agree to that premise. They can they can believe in that, um, and they can look at that and say, yeah, I'll, I think that if the law is depriving a person of justice, that by definition <laughs> is an unjust law. Not very hard to disagree, or sorry, not very hard to agree uh, with that statement. Um, and then here's the second one. Right? I got a speeding ticket because I was in a hurry. Um, again, uh, you can um, agree or disagree with that second premise. Um, just kind of depends, um, you, you know, you might say, well, there's other reasons why a person would get a speeding ticket. Um, but let's take the person at their word and say, yeah, you got a speeding ticket because you were in a hurry. Um, well, here's the conclusion of that argument then. 
right? My speeding ticket reflects an unjust law. Now, the thing is, is, is politicians especially send out arguments that are like this all the time, where, again, there, there's a combination between these two different types of ideas. And in fact, if we could go back to the fallacy section, we would look and see that this is actually kind of a red herring argument um, or a false conclusion where ultimately what, what the person is, is talking about really has nothing to do with the other two premises, but it mimics the idea in the premise in such a way that, that it seems like uh, the, the conclusion is, is following from the premises. So particularly it's, it's looking, it's combining that idea about the unjust law with the idea of the speeding ticket. Um, but again, this isn't a conclusion that you can actually form from the two premises that are given. And so that's what makes it an invalid argument. Um, and you see examples of these all the time where politicians will be asked a specific question about something and they will pivot away from the topic of that question um, towards discussing whatever it is that, that they have a, a better understanding of um, in, order to avoid, uh, in order to avoid giving clarity um, about, about that question. Let's look at another argument really quick here. And this one um, is um, a much more interesting argument, I think, and uh, one that has actually been made uh, in philosophy before. Um, so Thomas Merton is famous for this chapter in, in a book he has called No Man is an Island, um, where he makes this claim. He says, in order for love to be kept, it must be given away. And there, there are other uh, writers who've made uh, similar claims to this as well, but um, Merton is famous um, for having combine this together with uh, uh, his kind of view of, of the world and his view of, of how uh, human beings interact with, with their spiritual life. And so if you look at that, um, there are people who I think could easily disagree that that is, uh, that that is true. But I think on the whole, most people, when they look at that statement, would be able to agree at least in part with it and saying, yeah, you have to, on some level, uh, be able to, to uh, give love away in order to be able to keep it. Um, there, there's no such thing as a, a love that just is self-reflecting uh, all the time. It has to, in some point, uh, reflect on other people as well. Um, Plato, when he is talking about the nature of uh, democracy and tyranny, um, he actually, uh, in the Republic, uh, defines a tyrant uh, with, with this definition, which I think is really interesting. He says, a tyrant is always someone who only loves themselves. Um, and um, what, what he he ultimately is actually saying is, is that uh, the tyrant's love, uh, you know, flows to so many different objects and so many different things um, that ultimately um, it, it always becomes this kind of self-serving uh, so, sort of uh, idea. And so again, that the tyrant is always someone who ultimately the, the, the thing that they love the most is, is just themselves and they can only really love themselves. They can't understand love for anything else. Um, and so one of the arguments that we can make if you believe in both these things, uh, first of all, again, in order for love to be kept, it has to be given away. And uh, secondly, for a, uh, a tyrant um, can only really be defined as, as someone who only loves themselves. Um, then a conclusion that we could draw from that is tyranny can never keep love. That um, when you live in a state under tyranny, it's a loveless sort of state. And um, again, I think this is a good example of a valid argument um, that some people would look at and say that they believe it's also a sound argument and other people who would look at it and say, no, it's really just a valid argument um, because I can I can find reasons to disagree uh, with the truthness of, of one or two of those of those premises or all of those premises. And this is how most arguments end up forming uh, themselves. Uh, take a look at kind of a, a tighter argument here that Peter Senior makes in um, um, uh, a book uh, he has about animal ethics, um, where he he makes this kind of uh, idea. I, I use this in my um, uh, in my ethics course um, all the time, where he says, um, you know, ultimately, I think most people could agree it is immoral to allow a child to drown if you can save that child. 
Um, and again, this is a premise that people can grapple with, but um, you know, I've asked this question several times in my ethics class, and aside from people who uh, lack the capacity to swim, uh, almost everyone agrees, right? Yes, it is absolutely immoral that if you allow a child to drown when you could have saved them, uh, they drowned anyway. Uh, that's absolutely immoral. You should you should save all children who are drowning if you can save them. And so the second thing that he argues in connection with that is he says, okay, well, not saving a drowning child is the same moral action as not saving a starving child. Um, if we take away that first premise for a moment, because I think you can probably see where this argument is headed, um, and just think about that second premise by itself. Um, would you agree that not saving a drowning child is the same moral action as not saving a starving child? And I am sure you could probably think of some differences that exist between those two, but in terms of morality, I think a lot of people are willing to uh, to agree on some level that yeah that that is a problem if uh, I do not save uh, the uh, the starving child it is the same uh, level of action as if I don't save the drowning uh, child right the same kind of consequence follows the same type of agency uh, is involved um, right? the same type of action is being required here and so overall it seems as though um, this is the same kind of moral equivalency um, that exists and so the conclusion that Singer draws is he says well um, it's immoral then to do nothing while children starve throughout the world when we can save them. And uh, again, this is an interesting argument because uh, it is definitely a valid argument. It follows from the, the two premises uh, that are given. And at the same point, I think there are ways in which people looking at this kind of argument would say, well, I think there's a major difference between those those ideas um, and there's ways in which they would they would argue against it um, it does have a very kind of tight nature to it though of, of again um, it's it's hard to really disagree with the two premises and I, again there are ways that we could disagree with them we, we could say for instance that if you lack the capacity to swim um, then you aren't going to save the drowning child because um, instead of there being a drowning child there is a drowning uh, adult and a drowning child um, and there's ways in which you could disagree that uh, you know uh, saving a drowning child is different than saving a starving child um, you know one of them you might point out is that the, the obligations are are different what it takes to save a starving child um, is is a prolonged uh, period of um, engagement whereas what it takes to save a drowning child is just kind of a single action um, in, in a single moment and so we can definitely look at ways in which we would disagree with these premises, but overall, I, I think most people would be willing to say they agree with an argument that's like this because the premises are easy to agree with and the conclusion follows from, from the argument. And so if we can, I want to take a look really quick here at if we can start combining together um, these ideas of um, validity and soundness uh, into actual arguments themselves. So I want, to, I want to start off with a fake argument here. So if we look at the next slide, I have an argument about Elmo. <laughs> All right. This is the pro for uh, the greatness of Elmo side. Um, the argument I want to make is that Elmo is the greatest character on Sesame Street. And so one way I could go about doing that um, is for my first argument here, I'm going to talk about um, the money revenue that's made um, from Elmo on Sesame Street. So my argument is going to be that whoever has made the most money in revenue for Sesame Street obviously is the greatest character of Sesame Street. And I should have capitalized Sesame Street the second time there. All right, and so um, what I'm going to do to try and prove that point is I'm going to give as many facts and statistics um, and um, accompanying arguments that I can that Elmo has made the most money and revenue for Sesame Street. So I'm going to talk about things like the phenomenon of the Tickle Me Elmo. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the advertisement that goes um, during the Elmo kind of like segments. I'm going to talk about things like the, the sales of, of DVDs and streaming uh, uh, <laughs> services that are available because of 
uh, uh, of Elmo. I'm, I'm going to, as many different ways as it possible, reinforce this idea that Elmo has made the most money and revenue for Sesame Street. And so from that first argument, right, once I establish those kinds of facts, right, then it'll be obvious to the to the audience. I don't even have to say it, right? They'll, they'll know based off of just those two premises, Elmo has to be the greatest character. Another way I can go around arguing this is again with another valid argument. I can say, right, whatever segment has the largest viewership necessarily is the greatest segment. And Elmo's segment has had the largest average viewership since it began. Right? And I can talk about that viewership in, in a number of different ways um, as well. I can I can talk about uh, when Elmo is by himself. I can talk about when Elmo is with other characters. I can talk about um, you know year to year um, whether the viewership is getting larger or smaller uh, smaller on the years where where Elmo was there. Um, and uh, again, a, a conclusion can be drawn from that that I don't necessarily even have to speak. Um, people will be able to figure it out just based off of what I'm pointing out um, about the the large kind of um, average viewership um, with uh, with Elmo. And again, I could say because of that, Elmo is the greatest character on Sesame Street. Now, um, if you think about this for a second, there's a way in which you can disagree with both of those arguments. So even though they are valid arguments, again, you might not agree that they're sound arguments. Um, you could look at them and say, you know what, I think that some of those premises may be true, but I'm not for sure if you can really draw that kind of conclusion um, from those. So if we look at the first one, right, you, you could easily agree and say, you know, um, I definitely can see uh, the, uh, the fact that um, you think whoever has made the most money and revenue for Sesame Street is the greatest character of Sesame Street. Um, and I can agree that Elmo has made the most money and revenue for Sesame Street. Um, but let me give an alternative explanation. Right? It's not because Elmo is the greatest character. Instead, it's actually because we have spent more money promoting Elmo than we have any other character that is on Sesame Street. Um, if we compare um, how much money is uh, actually spent um, advertising Elmo as opposed to money that is spent advertising other Sesame Street characters, I see that actually uh, Big Bird, right, per dollar spent <laughs> is actually the better investment here, right? We've spent far fewer dollars um, uh, advertising Big Bird, and yet Big Bird has brought in a revenue stream that is comparable uh, to the revenue stream of Elmo. So we shouldn't just focus on the uh, the money revenue. We should focus on the money that is spent to generate that money revenue. Again, um, that's drawing a different conclusion from the evidence that's presented. Um, and again, that's giving a, a counter argument that, that relies on a, a valid argument as well. Um, but what's happening here is that uh, you're attacking uh, that, that conclusion that, that's being drawn that Elmo is the greatest character based off of the money revenue that, that is generated uh, from him. Uh, likewise, for the, for the second argument, you, you could attack the, the notion about viewership. You could say things like, hey, you know, um, when uh, Elmo began, viewership was already larger than it had ever been for any segment of uh, Sesame Street um, because there was a larger audience, right? Uh, the size of the United States was larger than it had ever been. And the increase in the population um, of, uh, of the world um, and the access that people have to Sesame Street uh, through the internet has, has increased access um, to, to Elmo. And so it's not that Elmo has increased the viewership, but it's just that the audience, the potential audience uh, for Sesame Street has actually grown larger. And so it, uh, instead of saying what is the, the average viewership for each character, that's not fair because if you compare the average viewership, you're taking characters like um, uh, the Count, right, that have been around since like the very beginning, since like the 60s of like Sesame Street, um, when, when the audience size and the world population were both significantly smaller, and you're comparing them uh, to, to where they are now, where the population size has gotten significantly larger.
And so, again, when you're presenting that argument, um, you can disagree with those conclusions by presenting alternative explanations, but then you can also just disagree with the premises as well and say, you know, I, I don't think that these premises are actually true. Um, for instance, I don't think that whoever uh, has made the most money and revenue for Sesame Street is actually the greatest character. Right? The way I define the greatest character is um, the one that has given the most educational benefits, right? Or the one that I think is the um, nicest right or kindest uh, the one that teaches uh, about citizen rights the best or um, anything along those lines the one that um, has introduced my vocabulary or expanded my vocabulary uh, the most um, there, there's so many different ways um, that you can you can attack the definition of, of the premises uh, themselves and so if we can take a kind of a final glance at this I want to take a, a very kind of pragmatic approach and looking at how we can, again, using um, the validity and soundness tests, um, how we can measure um, other people's arguments themselves and start thinking about um, the uh, arguments in terms of validity and, and soundness. And so what I want to do here is I want to focus on an article that I gave you. I'm going to switch the slide. So we have this article, it's called These Taxpayers Won't Get Stimulus Checks, That's Unjust. Um, I pulled it off of CNN's website um, on March 26, and it's talking about the stimulus package that is um, the $2 trillion um, plus uh, package that's gonna go um, to help combat uh, the coronavirus. It's written by Tim Breen, who I have a picture of really quick here. And before we even jump into the argument, I wanna focus um, on the um, uh, way in which this, this has been framed. Um, so I think it's an important, again, going back to what we've mentioned in um, our other classes about uh, fr framing an issue, is that it's, it's always better to kind of look at that worldview that people have and put the right kind of framing around it than it is to try and convince people to change their worldview. If you look at this for a second, um, we can see both the frame and the worldview um, in the title. The frame that he's focusing on here um, is um, the importance of the economy. Economy. Um, something that most everyone can agree on is that you know the stimulus uh, package um, should help support taxpayers in some sort of way. And so the frame that he's using is that there is some group of people who are taxpayers that won't get stimulus checks. Um, and that's unjust. And so already in, in the framework itself, we can see a, a type of argument that's being formed here um, where he's, he's pointing out a particular group of people. Now, what I think is interesting about this is instead of focusing a lot on his ethos um, at the beginning of this um, article, he actually introduces it um, almost entirely at, at the end. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't try to build up his credibility by focusing on on his own sort of like worldview. Instead, he, he tries to make an appeal um, towards reason, um, towards how people think about the economy um, in order to, to make his argument. And so I've, I've linked um, in uh, the modules tab uh, his, his article to help you um, see uh, just just exactly what he says. It's, it's not a very long article. You could read it um, in probably about five minutes or less. Um, but this is the main outline um, of, of his uh, argument is, um, first of all, he wants to point out um, that the point of the stimulus bill is ultimately to stimulate the economy, as he mentions in his um, uh, uh, title, but especially for taxpayers and not helping taxpayers is unjust. So again, <coughs> if we just look at the at the logic behind um, that that first idea, um, it in many ways falls under that category of, of a valid argument. We can agree that yes, if the stimulus bill is not, uh, uh, if the point of the stimulus bill is to stimulate the economy, um, it should be helping people who are paying taxes since they're the people who are um, helping continue the economy. And so not helping taxpayers in, in some ways is unjust. 
Now, again, there, there's a number of ways in which you can disagree with that, um, and uh, we're not quabbling over whether or not it's a sound argument, um, but whether or not it's, it's a valid argument. And so um, the structure of his argument really kind of follows through through two different mediums. Um, first of all, he, he makes his um, overall kind of position known uh, close to the beginning. He says, failing to aid immigrant workers will be disastrous to them and their families and will have a significant negative impact on the economy as they make up a significant portion of tax revenue through spending. Um, so that's uh, explicitly stated um, close to the beginning of his argument. He, he lets us know exactly where his position uh, stands. Um, and a, a lot of this article really focuses on that logos element of, of um, combining uh, together good organizational uh, skills um, in, in order to present uh, a sound uh, kind of position, or at least a, a valid uh, position for, for those who will not believe in the, in the truth of his premises. Um, the first argument that he offers um, in favor of this is by pointing out um, uh, the failure um, in 2008 during the recession um, of giving uh, immigrant workers uh, a, a stimulus uh, to go along with it. I mean, if I can, I'm, I'm actually I'm going to go ahead really quick here and, and show the main kind of premise that he makes for, for talking about that argument. Um, so again, he, he points out uh, these are almost uh, verbatim the first five sentences he has of the article where he says, um, among other components of the nearly $2 trillion relief package negotiated in the U.S. Senate, um, the agreement announced Wednesday morning reportedly will include checks of $1,200 to most American adults. Um, and he's very purposeful in using that word, most American adults, um, because um, he wants us to, to make that kind of contrast um, with the group of people who, who are not going to be getting uh, that, that stimulus. He says, these funds are supposed to help those who are out of work to pay for food and lodging and to stimulate the contracting U.S. economy, encouraging people to spend even while they are stuck at home. Now, that's not necessarily uh, a premise that has to go into the argument, but it's one to reinforce uh, the reason why you have this stimulus package in the first place. What, what, what are the purposes uh, behind it? Well, it's supposed to help the contracting U.S. economy, right? And so there's that sense of doom and inevitability that something must be done. Otherwise, it, it will all be doomsday all over. I um, mean, he says, unfortunately, the Senate proposal does not include all taxpayers. Now, what, what he's done in, in this beginning part is really play a lot more on the pathos um, kind of um, emotional component, where, again, he wants you to, to feel the strain of the economy and at the same time, the injustice of, of denying taxpayers um, the benefits that other taxpayers will get. And so he's very purposeful in not really using the word um, immigrant um, and especially a legal uh, immigrant in, uh, in this beginning portion because he wants you to think of people in terms of taxpayers and not in terms of uh, immigrants or legal or illegal uh, residents. He wants you to think of it as taxpayers and non-taxpayers. Um, and then he says this, right? Those who file their taxes using an individual taxpayer identification number, ITIN, instead of a social security number, have been left out, according to the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. Um, so he traces this back to that other argument he was making um, where he says that um, the uh, um, <laughs> economy itself uh, really has to uh, really has to be be stimulated by all people who are taxpayers. And so that includes people who have a social security number and that also includes people who have an ITIN. Um, and uh, what he wants us to, to realize is that, um, that the last kind of thing he, he's got here, right? Uh, omitting any taxpayer, um, but these especially, will exclude many of the American taxpayers. Um, and again, he's very purposeful in his language there of using the, the phrase American taxpayer because he wants you to, to, again, think in terms of that disjunctive syllogism. There's either taxpayers um, or there's not taxpayers. And the stimulus package is supposed to go to the American taxpayer. Um, and so he says, right, admitting these taxpayers will exclude many of the American taxpayers who are most vulnerable in the current crisis. 
undocumented immigrants. And here's where he's used a, a syllogism in order for us to understand um, his point of view. As instead of introducing this from the beginning as saying, I'm, I'm arguing for undocumented uh, immigrants to get stimulus funding. Instead, he's made this transference where he says, um, right, we, we want to help and benefit all American taxpayers. Anyone who is paying taxes is helping stimulate the economy. And so our stimulus package should go to people who are uh, able to do that the best. And then he says, um, you know, the core group of those American taxpayers um, are the people who are the most vulnerable in this crisis. And those are undocumented immigrants. Um, so again, he's, he's transferred that idea of, of a taxpayer, um, a valuable taxpayer, into the idea of uh, undocumented, undocumented immigrants um, as being an important part of that American taxpayer system. And so if we can take a look um, at um, how, how he argues um, from, from this point um, that, again, um, it, uh, undocumented immigrants are also um, American taxpayers. Um, again, he kind of bolsters two, two opinions here. Um, the first one uh, that, that I want to point out and um, kind of go back to is um, this one about the 2008 recession. So um, he points out the fact that in 2008, um, you know, we uh, did not give not not only undocumented uh, immigrants, not only did we not give them a stimulus, um, but we also um, didn't give people who had social security numbers um, that were married to people who had ITINs. And so he, he points out that um, this uh, has a, a number of consequences um, in 2008. He compares things like the unemployment rate um, of undocumented workers. He, he talks about how even though um, undocumented uh, immigrants make up um, 5% uh, of uh, the U.S. workforce. They make up 10% um, of, the, of the service workforce. Um, and so places that people tend to go to um, in the middle of a recession um, have a higher group of people who aren't working uh, in, in that sector um, because uh, of the fact that um, they've, they've been laid off or, um, you know, they uh, can't really find um, means um, during during a recession. And so he points out in the, in the same way that that was a failure in 2008, that will be a failure now. And of course, looking at that, you could um, easily point out that um, in some ways, that's also um, a, a fallacy of, of thought um, that uh, you uh, could could point to it as as a false cause and say, well, like one one does not cause the other. Um, there's differences that exist between 2008 and now. Um, th there's ways that you could attack um, the, the premises of of that argument, and you could even you know kind of point out that there's there's differences um, to making that analogy not quite. Um, squared. Um, the second argument that he provides um, follows uh, a, a very valid kind of point of view. And so again, the, the main focus that I think a lot of people would, would uh, look at um, is whether or not um, it's actually true um, that, the, uh, that these premises um, are, uh, are, are true. And so um, one of the arguments that he says is that lower income workers do not have the financial margin to save. And so they need the stimulus the most because they keep their money flowing into the un, uh, economy, unlike those who save. And so this is really kind of taking a shot at people who have a lot more money, where he's pointing out that people who have disposable income, especially during a recession, tend to hoard that uh, extra money. They don't go out and buy like a new boat. Um, they don't go out and spend all their money be because they have that excess of capital. Um, they they tend to hoard it. So um, a good example of this is like right now, um, the people who at the very beginning um, of uh, the coronavirus outbreak were able to go out and buy like five hundred dollars worth of toilet paper. Um, you know, they're they're not really going out and spending their money now. Like they went out, they bought the toilet paper, and like they're hoarding that, and like they have it. 
Um, whereas the people who live paycheck to paycheck and cannot go out and buy $500 worth of toilet paper, right? They, they have to wait for their paycheck to kick in. He points out those people actually, when they get their money, um, are the more likely uh, culprits of um, spending money into the economy and making it work um, because they don't have the luxury of being able to decide how much they're going to pull back. And so he points out that immigrants themselves disproportionately fall in this category of worker um, because they tend to not have an excess of savings uh, for them to fall back on. And instead, they live in this kind of paycheck to paycheck sort of uh, moment. And then um, he gives again some, some different examples of, of why uh, he believes that's true. Um, and he, he really ends this um, uh, essay, ends this uh, opinion column by saying that, um, uh, again, fo focusing on his own ethos and wh where he stands, um, he says that you know, he, he doesn't really think um, that uh, amnesty is an answer. He doesn't think that um, people should just um, be given legal status um, because they're taxpayers. Um, and it's interesting that he waits to the end of this essay to say that instead of the beginning, but if you think about it, he's trying to convince people of all different types um, of, of schools of thought. He's trying to, again, focus on that economy uh, end. And so he doesn't want people to think uh, of him as a person who believes in granting amnesty. He doesn't want people to think of him as a person who wants to deny people amnesty. Instead, he wants to think about it in terms of taxpayer and non-taxpayer. Um, and um, the final kind of argument that he makes here is he says it doesn't really matter whether or not um, amnesty can be granted to people and it doesn't really matter um, if it can't um, because he says ultimately Congress right now cannot do anything during this pandemic to reform illegal immigration. So no matter what side of the fence you, you stand on, he's pointing out the fact that um, there's nothing pragmatically that can actually be done about it currently. Instead, um, what can be done and what should be done um, is what will help stimulate the economy the most. Um, and in his mind, that's give stimulus checks to the lower income workers, especially immigrants who keep the economy flowing. And so what's interesting is that he's um, combined this with the, with the uh, argument previously. And in one way, this is a syllogism because he's basically saying right, that, that lower income workers um, make up a, a part of the tax paying economy. They also make up a uh, part of just the general economy and keeping things flowing, keeping things moving. Um, and so based off of those ideas, um, right, those are the people, um, if we're going to say that the people who, who deserve the stimulus checks the most are the ones who do those two things. Um, then he says, you know, based off of those ideas, um, then it's really immigrants who should get the stimulus uh, checks as, as well. It, it shouldn't be withheld from them um, because they, they do all of the same things that um, we would expect of, of other people. And so what I want to uh, point out in, in closing here is that um, in either, either dimension, whether uh, you're focusing um, on just the, the ethos, logos, and pathos kind of uh, portions of, uh, of your speech, um, or, or whether you're coming back to the validity and soundness of particular kinds of arguments. Um, these aren't things that stand opposed to each other. Um, in a, in a well-constructed speech, these, these are things that you, you put together um, in order to make the strongest argument you possibly can. And so in looking at um, arguments that you want to make for yourself, it's important to go through and, and think about um, not just the structure um, of your arguments and you know looking at this that he has a particular kind of structure that he's following uh, through this essay um, but also thinking about in each individual argument that you have um, is it a valid argument that you're presenting and what are the ideas that you can use to strengthen the premises of your valid arguments so that people see them as sound arguments um, and again uh, going back to just this article um, you know, he could have written this from the standpoint of, of talking about immigration first, um, but instead he chose to use the framework of talking about the economy. He chose to, to use the language of talking about taxpayers instead of undocumented immigrants. 
Um, I mean, he, he eventually gets to talking about undocumented, uh, undocumented immigrants, but not until he qualifies um, what he's explaining about being an American taxpayer. And then once once he has you hooked in with those arguments about being a taxpayer, um, that's when he extends it to talking about, well, what about right um, taxpayers who are undocumented immigrants um, what what category do they fall under um, and why would we deny them when they're so beneficial towards our economy why would we deny them a stimulus check um, when in fact um, doing so could could be a great economic cost uh, towards us um, so as you go through these next couple of sections, you're going to look at this uh, argument um, between, uh, or this debate, I should say, between uh, James Baldwin and William Buckley. And I want you to have in mind while you're watching that debate, you know, what are some of the valid arguments that each person is making um, and what would make them sound or unsound arguments, right? Um, what are some of the premises that you agree or disagree with? Um, when you read the article by Mira Jacob, which is a similar uh, Kind of argument that James Baldwin uh, makes in, in his uh, arguments, but also at the same time, uh, very different arguments that she presents as well. There's there's kind of similar themes between them, um, but major differences in how they go about arguing um, for the, for these similar kinds of themes. Again, think about um, what what are the uh, the arguments that you would say um, are not only valid but sound, and then what are the arguments that you you see the validity behind them, but the soundness um, it is something maybe you, you don't fully uh, agree with because one of the premises um, may, may be questionable to you. And so in, in thinking about that, um, I hope uh, you have understood the difference between validity and soundness. If you have any more questions for me, uh, email me. Thank you and have a wonderful day.